don't have that computer literacy. Some people don't have a computer at all or at home. So um, people would have to find ways to access a computer. And the thing that changed as well is that when the, the paper forms were set up, you could, um, you could turn it in late, a few weeks late, and then whatever debt you might have accrued would be taken off. In this new system, whatever debt you might have gotten before you managed to turn in the form would stay. Um, and then and for issues for transportation, so um, picking up school, I mean picking up students from to go to school and then dropping them back off, you would only be able to have access to um, the public school buses if you lived more than three miles out. So anybody living within the three mile radius of the school would not have access to a public bus. And um, this is actually very challenging because around the school that um, uh, the the administrator that I interviewed from that school said that there's a prevalent gang living, um, inhabiting that area, and that the most gang infested and poverty infested uh, street is actually 2.7 miles from the school. So those people on that street don't have access to a public bus. They would have to walk, if sometimes, you know, the parents, they don't even have a car, the parents would have to get up early um, to go to work. So they would have to walk to school through that um, area. And then uh, the stigma of a different culture and language. So um, there are instances where um, the, the school might not have um, programs implemented in order to meet the, the needs of every student. So they would take students that perhaps um, didn't have any working English at all, and there were a lot of cases actually like that, and they would put them in special education programs. So uh, it was almost of mercy to them, they would say, um, so they wouldn't have to face the stigma of not knowing the language and not being able to interact with their peers. And then, um, actually, this will be interesting. How many of you know what tinsel is? Can you raise your hand? Tinsel. So, let's see, you know? Okay, um, that was actually something that the administrator that I interviewed, he had something to say about that. There was a, he had walked in on a class where um, one of those special education classes where they were playing charades. And um, it, it was around Christmas time, and they had um, some of the white people in the classes had asked, um, had been trying to like, sh like demonstrate what tinsel was, and the person didn't get it in time, the Chiganix person. And then they were met with <coughs> stigma, with, um, with, uh, ridicule, like, you're stupid. I didn't know, when the minister asked me what tinsel was, I didn't know either. And then he said, it's, still, it's that thing that goes like around the room during Christmas time. You know, like kind of like the oh. glittery thing. <laughs> so like, exactly, you know, um, that, that shows a disconnect between cultures, you know, like, um, so not, not to um, put you on the spotlight, you know, but you knew what tinsel was while most of the rest of us didn't, you know? Right, and I mean, there's probably a linguistic reason. Exactly, so that's the disconnect where um, you can see how pedagogically um, or even curriculum based there can be disparities in what's actually shown to people. Okay, so there's misguided allocation of funds. So um, there are a school district bought new textbooks for uh, mathematics. The administrator told me that district-wide, only about 20% of the, of the teachers actually utilize the textbook how it's supposed to be used. So instead of checking in with the students, or checking in with the teachers to see what, what resources they needed exactly, what real-world scenarios could help get that point across, they bought those textbooks, probably for political reasons, uh, monetary reasons, and now 80% of the people, 80% of the students and the teachers do not utilize that book. It's just getting dust. So that shows how um, misguided some allocations of funds can be, as well as programs. There was a program put on in a high school that was anti-smoking. However, a study showed that, no, a study um, school-wide showed that most students don't see just smoking as the problem, and they don't smoke themselves. It was that same high school where there's liquor stores and there's um, gangs right next to it. So why wouldn't you allocate funds 
to um, actually as part of the same study it said that um, they saw alcohol as a bigger problem they saw it in their home lives than they would experience it themselves so why not make a program catered to alcohol alcoholism not uh, tobacco use and um, lack of representation and advocacy in classes so this speaks to the larger issue of uh, uh, white background pedagogy and curriculum. So there was no ethnic studies programs put in place at any of these high schools. One of them was actually getting it next year. And the reason that happened was because there was a nationwide backlash from a school in that same school district. That um, And I was actually going to include it in this presentation, but I, didn't, uh, I wanted to be more sensitive. Um, so there was an issue where there was a a white student who had on a confederate flag shirt and he had two um, depictions of African American males being hung and um, he said we got those uh, from off the pier and so that got nationwide uh, coverage and so that's the only reason why school districts are actually implementing the ethnic studies program programs in order to um, create more of a connect between the white students and the other students. But that's not the reason why there should be ethnic studies programs. The reason they should be there is to um, give people of a different background the option of learning about their history as well, instead of the history um, that has been written by other people that doesn't look like them. Okay. I don't have a lot of time left, so let me get through this. Implications for changes in policy. So, uh, restorative practices of our punitive discipline. So, I didn't really get to touch upon this that much, but um, uh, many of the educators feel like they um, they would like to see more students suspended. That's the that's what they got. For, that's what they would tell the administrators. And this particular administrator had. Um, I worked workshops on restorative practices where he would sit down each individual and they would talk it out. He would attempt, um, he would have strikes put against them instead of straight going into suspension and um, most students would be able to work it out and not have to um, have that on the record. Um, a second implication is allocation of resources based on student needs assessment over district assumptions. So it was what I talked about where there's um, they would spend money on textbooks or programs that weren't necessarily needed when there was actually better use of the money that was going into those programs. So the student needs assessments would be, need to be made. And finally, innovations in pedagogy and curriculum, including greater support for ethnic studies programs. So um, I think that speaks for itself. You know, um, I didn't thrive until I actually took my, um, my Chicano history class, and that's actually what I think made me see the difference. I wish I would have had it in high school. I think I would have done better. And um, I had another slide, but I'm out of time. So there you go. Um, that's why it's, it's important, because often people get disillusioned with education, and they turn to deviant behavior in order to um, get that sort of, like for example, a person might become more machista and might fight more, because that's where they get that, um, that that, um, like, oh, good job, you know, you're doing something good, you know, like, okay, you know, you can mess that dude up, so, um, you know, good job on that, whereas they can't get in the classroom. And, finally, thank California State University, Sacramento. And the title of my presentation is Issues in Chicanx Latinx Doctoral Education, although I'm focusing specifically on the graduate school curriculum. So in this study, which is still a work in progress, I still have to you know, analyze uh, write the you know, theoretical and practical implications. Uh, anyways, so in this study, I examined Chicanx Latinx doctoral students' experiences with the graduate school curriculum. Uh, the data are based on in-depth qualitative interviews conducted with 24 Chicano Latino doctoral students at a research intensive university uh, that is located in the western region of the United States. 
Uh, I ground my analysis and intersectionality theory, so that means I'm going to examine how race, class, gender uh, inequalities are structured into the doctoral or PhD curriculum. Uh, in terms of lit review, research on the race, class, gender, and sexuality politics of the grad school curriculum is still relatively scarce. I had one of the few studies that examined the politics of the grad school curriculum. Uh, Mary Romero and Eric Margolis found through their survey of 92 sociology graduate programs and qualitative interviews of 26 women of color grad students that race and ethnicity was inadequately integrated into the graduate school curriculum. In fact, 26 departments that they surveyed did not offer a single course on race and ethnicity, even though six of those departments listed race as an area of specialization. So despite a wealth of scholarly literature that is produced by scholars of color, sociology grad programs continue to offer a very Eurocentric reading of the discipline. So the authors noted, for example, students reported that faculty tended not to assign books or articles written by African Americans, Chicanos, Chicanas, Native Americans, and other domestic sociologists of color. The absence of scholars of color in the curriculum resulted in a graduate training in theories of ethnicity, emphasizing the classic models of Euro-American assimilation rather than theoretical perspectives presented in recent research and writings by scholars uh, of color. For example, critical race theory, social reproduction and resistance theories, or racial identity formation theories. So then a central finding of Romero and Margolis, Margolis is that women of color fi uh, feel ill at ease in graduate departments that are seemingly designed for a, quote, ideal type of graduate student, which was invariably represented as white, male, heterosexual, and from a middle class background. So in the present study that I reviewed, Chicanx, Latinx doctoral students' experiences with the graduate school curriculum. Uh, first, I described their experiences in graduate seminars, and then I also analyze their experiences with the curriculum, noting how race, class, gender, sexuality, etc., are integrated into the uh, graduate curriculum. So in terms of their experiences in graduate seminars, uh, respondents typically noted that the dynamics in the classroom were highly contingent on the student composition and also on the type of professor that was teaching the course. So in other words, their experiences varied from class to class, so that there was no monolithic graduate seminar experience. There were, however, several patterns that emerged in their description of their experience in grad programs. First, respondents generally preferred interactive seminars rather than classes where professors do not encourage student participation. Also, many respondents felt that conservative faculty were less interested in engaging with students in mutual interactive dialogue compared to progressive or more politically liberal faculty. So in other words, conservative faculty tend to be more authoritarian or quote know-it-alls and, and are generally less tolerant of competing perspectives, although some respondents noted that even liberal faculty can be intolerant, a bit intolerant at times. Progressive faculty tended to act as moderators or facilitators of classroom discussion, while conservative faculty dictated or regulated the flow and content of classroom discussion. Also, several respondents noted that having a supportive cohort, especially one including a substantial presence of Chicanx or Latinx peers, was conducive to positive classroom interactions and meaningful dialogue. So having a supportive cohort was especially critical in classes where students' views were different from those of the faculty member. Finally, most respondents noted that race, class, and gender dynamics were operating within the classroom setting, although some respondents were more attuned uh, to and critical of these processes than others. So many uh, respondents were cognizant and critical of the racial dynamics that were operating within the classroom setting, and especially of racist microaggressions that they witnessed or experienced. For instance, uh, these included interruptions by white students or faculty, racist or ethnocentric comments by peers or faculty, rude behaviors by white students like passing notes, snickering, uh, dominating the classroom discussion by white students, especially white males, uh, white students' antagonism or hostility towards topics concerning race, also disparate treatment by white and, a, and in a few instances minority faculty in terms of receiving lower grades, less eye contact, less validation for students of color within the classroom setting, and also racial segregation within the classroom setting. So some respondents noted that across departments in seminars, students tend to segregate on the basis of race in the sense that white students sit on one side of the room, uh, students of color sit on the other side of the room. Um, and so these separations, some res uh, respondents noted, tend to reflect basically different differences in standpoint. 
uh, those who, in other words, thought alike, tended to sit on one side of the room, or you know, they tended to sit with each other. Respondents also noted sexist dynamics within the classroom setting. Uh, for example, these included men's monopoly, the classroom discussion, interruptions of female grad students by the men, by the male students, sexist comments made by male graduate students or faculty, patriarchal biases on the part of male faculty, including men of color faculty, gender segregation as well within the classroom setting. Interestingly, several male interviewees acknowledged their male privilege insofar as they recognized that microaggressions were more often directed toward the women within the classroom setting. Also, some had been less attuned to gender dynamics until a fellow student, typically a female doctoral student, brought issues of sexism to their attention. For example, Roberto said that uh, he had not been aware of sexist behavior within the classroom until it was pointed out to him by a fellow female grad student. And finally, a few study participants reported observing classist microaggressions, or just class-based inequities within the classroom. Uh, examples of classist microaggressions included things like prejudicial attitudes towards poor students or working class students, the assumption, for instance, that they're, quote, not smart, or that they don't belong in graduate school. Also, ignorance about working class graduate students' lived reality, such as their need to work while going to school. And also general ignorance and or insensitivity towards issues of poverty and class oppression. Class dynamics were also manifest in classroom discourse and dialogue insofar as socioeconomically or middle class you know, students tended to dominate class discussion and also garnered more positive attention from the faculty member uh, given their elite academic preparation and background. Uh, you know, they were conversant in quote, highfalutin theories and otherwise erudite academic discourse compared to the working class students. Also, respondents felt that the affluence of their peers was simultaneously a source of privilege and ignorance so for instance, one respondent, Maya, recalled feeling frustrated with her peers' ignorance about class issues, things that she believed stemmed from their privileged and buffered lifestyles. Also, or although Maya as well as other Chicano respondents did not want to assume the stereotypical role of a quote, pissed off woman of color, it was difficult for them to remain dispassionate in light of their peers' ignorance and insensitivity towards issues of poverty and class oppression. And here's a quote from Maya. I remember one seminar I had uh, one gentleman said, now that I read that, I know that there's a lot of poverty and hunger in the world. And I lost it. I said, excuse the language, where the fuck do you come from? <laughs> and then the professor said, please, remember you're in a seminar. I said, no. I just can't believe you're getting a PhD and not know that there's poverty and hunger in the world. So sometimes I think that as much as I learned and hope that they learned from me, sometimes the situations were heated. I think that's part of the learning process. And like I said, I don't always want to be the pissed off woman of color, but sometimes I'm like, wait a minute. That's what privilege means. They're very buffered. So again, that was their experiences concerning the seminars, their seminar experiences. In terms of the integration of race, class, gender, and sexuality in the curriculum, uh, this is what respondents said. So the first year grad curriculum is generally comprised of a core program that in, uh, introduces students to the basic concepts, theories, and methods of their discipline. Many respondents were critical of the conservative, meaning Eurocentric, sexist, heterosexist character of the first year curriculum. For instance, Raul said that uh, the core curriculum, quote, disregards his existence. He also felt that the theory classes that were offered during the first year, which were usually taught uh, by conservative faculty, were, quote, outdated, and that they failed to reflect post-1970s theoretical developments and emergent paradigms within sociology or the social sciences. Carla also reported that women and racial ethnic minorities were virtually non-existent as topics of discussion in one of her theory classes. She also said that sexuality was never discussed. Uh, Raul also felt that his program was very heterocentric. Esther also said the core requirements and stuff like that, I didn't really like the curriculum in any of it. I feel like a lot of the stuff left out race, gender, or sexuality. So after the first year, students are generally able to enroll in classes that reflect their own particular research interests. Respondents were often, though not always, exposed to a more diverse curriculum after the first year in these seminars. So although many respondents felt more comfortable in classes that focus on their specialization, they were still critical of the overall structure and the content of the graduate curriculum in their department. So for instance, many noted that uh, the courses in their areas of specialization, which often included race, class, gender studies, were not offered consistently, unlike other courses. So what they offered, the classes were usually large, resulting in, le resulting in less individual attention to students. So in other sources of concern, including uh, included lack of faculty specializing in the students' areas of interest, 
a lack of variety of courses and students' areas of research, lack of exposure to competing perspectives and methodologies in the discipline, and the lack of integration of intersectionality or women of color feminisms. And so some respondents were critical of the way in which race, class, gender issues, and women of color scholarship were integrated in classes beyond the first year. So in instance, some noted that in courses focusing on gender, which were usually taught by a white female faculty member, they devoted just one week's time to issues regarding women of color. Moreover, faculty assigned a lot of textbooks with just a few pages devoted to women of color. And so given the token attention paid to women of color, some thought that white feminists continue to be, quote, exclusionary. Respondents also reported that professors uh, generally failed to expose students to a comprehensive intersectional analysis. That is, one axis of inequality is typically given precedence over others in courses focusing on race or race, class, and gender. Roberto and Consuelo, for instance, felt that there was insufficient attention to class in their respective departments. Also, Roberto noted that in some classes, class was subsumed to race, while in others, gender was subsumed under class. So in short, as Rebecca observed, quote, faculty do not make a conscious effort at making these intersections evident, end quote. Still other respondents said that while some professors integrate race in their syllabus, they have no praxis. So that is, professors' theoretical understandings of the mechanisms responsible for the reproduction of race, class, and gender inequality do not inform their daily practice. So this sentiment was articulated by both Raul and Tatiana. Raul, for instance, felt that despite teaching and researching issues of race, some professors perpetuate racism through their daily interactions with students in the program. He said, well, professors study race, and yet they don't know how to practice it themselves, end quote. Tatiana also observed that while intersectionality as theory is integrated into her classes, professors and fellow students fail to incorporate the insights gleaned from the literature on intersectionality into their own research and daily life. So again, there is a lack, a lack of praxis. Uh, so despite having access to a relatively more diverse curriculum after the first year, many respondents felt that classes and race, class, and gender studies were still limited in focus. Uh, in fact, some felt that they learned more about race, racial, ethnic minority, and or feminist perspectives from their peers, or through their own individual reading rather than in seminars. So although graduate seminars obviously cannot cover the entire gamut of scholarly production in a given field, some faculty apparently continue to systematically marginalize and or exclude feminist and racial ethnic minority perspectives from the curriculum. So perhaps unsurprisingly, respondents also lack exposure to scholarship produced by Chicanx and Latinx scholars. Only a few faculty, mostly Chicanx, Latinx faculty, or other you know, liberal faculty, integrated scholarship produced by Chicanos and Latinos into the curriculum. Some noted that the marginality of Chicano knowledge production within the academy is such that even the very term Chicano, or Chicana, or Chicanex, is deemed problematic within mainstream settings, given its political, leftist, sort of radical, uh, more progressive connotations. When asked how issues related specifically to the Chicanex Latinx community were addressed in her department, for instance, Consuelo replied terribly, that invisibility and that colonial or racial dominance is so strong I don't even think that they use the word Chicano or Chicanex. It's all about Latinidad now. So while a minority respondent said that their department held Chicanex and Latinx scholarship in high esteem, most felt that mainstream faculty disparaged it, viewing it as, quote, narrow, too specialized, exotic, and or easy research. So in short, several study participants reported that unless their research was grounded in, quote, dead white male theory, with the exception of Marx, because that was problematic to them. <laughs> Their academic work was deemed, quote, non-scholarly. In fact, the, quote, ideal grad student, at least from the standpoint of conservative white male faculty, was one whose research and worldview was grounded in Eurocentric and patriarchal and heterosexist and sexist epistemologies. So in short, uh, the doctoral socialization process is clearly unequal on the basis of race, class, and gender, and I argue that more sociological research in particular needs to problematize the grad school curriculum, especially including in sociology. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm to introduce Mike. So, last but not least, we have Mike Chavez, professor at Cal State Long Beach. The title of his presentation is The Latinx Academic Precariat in the gig economy. Is this a Mac adapter? Oh well, I don't need the PowerPoint. It's a Bible letter. Uh, 
All right. <clears throat> HDMI adapter? Oh, that'd be awesome. Oh, HDMI, I don't. Oh, no. I have the, the, uh, <clears throat> the old one. Oh, it's alright. I can survive this. Right. You're not going to see my cool illustration. Um, <clears throat> okay, so good morning. Um, thank you all for being here. So, my name is Mike Chavez. I'm a faculty member at uh, Long Beach State. Um, I've been there for four years now. Um, I'm, what I'm going to be talking about today is something that has arisen from my own experiences within academia that I feel is actually extremely important in discussing what it actually means to be a faculty member, what it means to be a professor. What it means especially is people who are actively in, in, engaging with students to encourage them to pursue, um, to pursue higher ed. When I, first began my, um, when I first began my career teaching, um, I Remember, I would make it a, a, I'd make a concerted effort to encourage every one of my students to at least have grad school on the table as one of their potential options as they were moving through their bachelor's degrees. I still do that. I still teach every one of my classes, and I tell them at the very beginning that the way that I prepare my courses is if is as if every one of them is going to be applying, and these are the things that I feel that they're going to need once they get accepted and they start moving through that graduate process. However, I do have to say in the back of my mind, I feel a little bit guilty when I'm actually um, providing that as in a way that seems like the best opportunity or the most um, lucrative or even economically stable opportunity. You know, I, I find myself being more supportive of, not more supportive, but more than previously supportive of some of my students who even pursue careers in law enforcement, which is extremely antithetical to a lot of the work that I do and a lot of the, the scholarship that I produce. But knowing that for a lot of our students, particularly our Latino Latino students, that's going to be one of their best options for having a stable career after graduation. So to situate myself within this, I'm in my fourth year on the tenure track at Long Beach State, but within the larger span of my career, this is actually my 11th year in the Cal State system. I began teaching while I was a graduate student. I began teaching at Cal State Los Angeles where I was there for four years, bouncing around from department to department to department. I had continuous employment, but I was in four departments at one time um, at Cal State Los Angeles. Sociology, Chicano Studies, Pan-African Studies, Latin American Studies. In my fourth year, I also got hired in the Department of Sociology and Psychology at Cal Poly Pomona. And in my last year, in my seven year career before I settled in this one position, I was also um, an adjunct faculty member at Pierce College. So I live in Riverside. If for, so for folks who know Southern California, I was commuting an average of seven to 800 miles a week. The time I spent in my car was between 15 and 17 hours every single week to make ends meet. My very last year on the part-time track is it's so you know affectionately called. <coughs> I was teaching <coughs> well to put this into context so at Long Beach State we have one of the highest teaching loads in the Cal State system for full-time faculty. We teach what's called a 4-4 so for those of you who aren't familiar, it's four classes a semester, four in fall, four in spring. So eight classes a year as a full-time faculty member. My last two years as a part-time faculty member, I taught 20 classes each year just to make ends meet. So once I reached my position, once I had this kind of this, this uh, full-time stability, I remember not only did I feel, have these feelings of, <laughs> wanting to celebrate and you know I've I've achieved something but more than that and I have to be honest was an overwhelming sense of anger looking back and realizing that I was that like the level of work that I was engaged in was far more exploited than I had even realized at the time 
And so I remember telling myself, this is something that I really want to actually explore and get these narratives from a lot of different people who are in similar situations. And so this is, this is one of the outcomes of this project. I'm pointing as if I'm <laughs> <laughs> The ravages of neoliberalism have effectively impacted, have devastated nearly every single economy in today's, um, in today's America. Despite what a lot of our students think, being a professor, although it comes with some degree of prestige, some degree of status, it's always fun to whip out the title when you, know, you don't like somebody. I don't make anybody call me doctor unless they pissed me off. <laughs> Most people have a very misguided uh, view of what it means to actually be a faculty member. So we live in, a, in an economy right now that's characterized more, more um, well, it's better characterized as what's known as the gig economy. The gig economy is characterized by a growth in jobs that are overwhelmingly part-time, temporary, based on a contract-by-contract -contract basis, freelance labor, things that might even be mischaracterized, such as in the trucking industry, where truck drivers are full-time employees of a company, but are paid and treated as if they are private contractors with no access to benefits, no access to stability, paying for their own maintenance on their vehicles. This is especially why it's important for faculty, and this is, I'm, I'm constantly finding myself scolding faculty, <laughs> why we need to recognize ourselves as part of the working class. Because despite the relative privilege that we have in terms of our status, we're treated in many of the same ways that people in lots of other manual labor industries um, are. <coughs> There's little to no promise of permanence or stability in this gig economy. So this, this helps you to arrive at what, what is known as the academic precariat. So the precariat is a term that combines precarious in terms of the positions of our employment for, 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 uh, for a lot of faculty with proletariat, right? Recognizing that even in these positions, we face a lot of the same situations and circumstances of an increasingly casualized labor force. The universities, the university setting, all colleges that, that fact, are overwhelmingly dependent on what are known as contingent faculty. This is actually the proper term when it comes to academic labor for part-time labor. Contingent faculty are faculty who do the majority of teaching in any school, but whose employment is contingent on a number of other factors, including enrollment, including budget, including space constraints, including the demands of a department, curricular demands, the ebb and flow that happens every single quarter by quarter, every single semester by semester basis. So who falls under the contingent faculty umbrella? I do. Adjunct faculty? <laughs> As I think most are actually known. So in the Cal State system, which I think probably, I'm assuming most of the folks in this room are familiar with the Cal State system, which is a, a public university system in California comprised of three, 23 different campuses across California. Um, our term is lecturers. Faculty who are visiting professors or in limited appointment who might have all the benefits on